have uh, a wonderful speaker. Um, last time with uh, Ms. Donna Illibrun, she was the superintendent of, is the superintendent of Catholic schools. And uh, this next talk um, is going to deal with a very, I would say, different uh, place of emphasis um, in this spectrum of conversations uh, with, in terms of Catholic education. And uh, this talk will deal with Catholic education and contemplation. Um, so this will be a very different flavor from what we had uh, a month back. And uh, I would like to you know, take this opportunity to welcome our speaker uh, for this evening um, uh, here at the, uh, the Norbertine Spirituality Center. Um, and I was very happy that he was willing to accept uh, this, this, I would say, both offer and a, and a challenge to talk on, a, I think, what's actually a very challenging subject. Um, we have tonight with us uh, Father Matthew Doherty, um, who I also was a novice classmate with uh, when I was uh, in my novitiate uh, with the Norbertines. Um, and uh, Matthew subsequently, in addition to getting his Master of Divinity and his uh, uh, Master uh, in Arts of Theology at uh, Catholic Theological Union, then went on to get yet a higher degree, a terminal degree, uh, a doctorate in Yale in biology, and now uh, teaches as an assistant professor of biology at St. Herbert College, and is also a member of the corporate board of Notre Dame Academy, a secondary school in Green Bay. Uh, I could add probably a number of other accomplishments. He was also on the board of trustees for St. Herbert College until uh, he uh, assumed his role as a member of the St. Herbert College faculty. And he is with us tonight, I think, to offer uh, a, a Weather, weather, rather well-rounded uh, uh, pastiche of experience and, and theological perspective as we continue this, this conversation on Catholic education. And so without any further ado, and just you know, please uh, welcome him warmly because he spent a lot of hours on the plane to get here and he'll spend a lot of hours on the plane to, uh, to return back to uh, De Pere, Wisconsin uh, tomorrow, uh, Father that is Reverend Dr. Matthew Doherty. Appreciate it, thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, uh, Father Stephen, and to Eric Dole, and to all the Norbertines here. It's really good uh, to be with you to talk about a topic that I care a lot about, and I think uh, a topic that is swirling around Catholic education circles, at least uh, up in Green Bay where I'm from, and hopefully around here too. Um, before we do that, uh, may I just invite us to quickly uh, center ourselves and remember that we're in the presence of God. In the, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> so, one of the questions that I would like to address today is not so much whither Catholic education, but why Catholic education. And this is a pressing question, I think, for Catholics today, and it's pressing for parents who are wondering where to send their kids to school, and it's pressing for Catholic school administrators who are charged with articulating a value proposition to encourage young families to spend their hard-earned money at a Catholic school rather than going to a public school for free. It's pressing for Catholic school teachers who are often the main shapers of the Catholic school experience for their students, and it's pressuring for sponsoring institutions and dioceses and religious orders who oversee these schools and their mission. So the question, why Catholic education, is pressing today, especially as we see enrollments decline across the country. However, uh, in the not too distant past, this question didn't really need answering, because the answer was in some ways, self-evident. In the 19th century, the United States saw a steady stream of immigrants from Catholic countries, especially from Ireland, Italy, and French Canada. And these Catholic immigrants who came to uh, America 
often didn't receive a very warm welcome. <clears throat> in fact, they often found themselves quite marginalized. They didn't have a lot of money. They weren't familiar with the customs, attitudes, or culture of the resident American population. And some of them didn't even know English. And perhaps most of all, they came to an America full of anti-Catholic and anti-immigrant uh, bigotry. Uh, perhaps you've all seen the 19th century window signs that read, Irish need not apply. Or political cartoons, like this one, uh, where you see these alligators with bishop mitres for mouths, swimming from Rome to the United States, with a Protestant gentleman standing on shore protecting his children from what appears to be Rome's attempt to conquer the new world through immigration. I think for many of us, this world is somewhat hard to imagine. Uh, of course, at the time, the United States was, for all intents and purposes, a Protestant country. Protestantism had shaped the 19th century American culture, including inside the classroom, where religious instruction and prayer was still present. And so immigration from Catholic countries was a threat to the Protestant hegemony. But at the same time, the Catholic Church was more insular than it is now, too. There was not much mixing between Catholics and Protestants. It should be no surprise, then, that many of these immigrants moved to neighborhoods first that they could afford, but also where they could be among their own people, where they could speak their own language, and where they could educate their children in the customs and traditions of their homeland. In these neighborhoods, the local parish was not just a place to fulfill a Sunday obligation. It became the center of activity, of community activity, and a place of immigrant identity and culture. A number of religious communities also popped up within these neighborhoods, especially women religious, and they staffed the parish schools with little to no compensation. It is no surprise then why an Irish or Italian family would send their child to a Catholic school. It's where their identity, their culture, their values, and their faith could be shared with the next generation. And because of the flocks of nuns and priests teaching in the classrooms, it was at little financial cost. The question of why Catholic schools didn't need to be asked for 19th and, tw and early 20th century immigrant Catholics. The answer was self-evident. And because it was self-evident, Catholic schools thrived. And the number of Catholic schools and universities multiplied by, the or by orders of magnitude. I think the next question, then, is what happened? How did we go from building school after school, university after university, to shutting so many of their doors for good? Of course, the answer to this is still debated, and it remains quite controversial. Uh, but if I may be somewhat irresponsible and wade into the debate without getting too immersed within it, I think it was caused by two things. First, in the mid-20th century, uh, religious orders started to demand a fair wage for their labor. They were no longer willing to subsidize the cost of Catholic education by teaching for almost nothing. Of course, there are justice arguments to be made here, including from St. Paul, who says that a laborer deserves his wage. The consequence, however, is that the cost of Catholic schools skyrocketed. When this increase in cost was combined with the vocation crisis, especially among women religious, and Catholic schools had to pay lay men and women to take over for the poorly paid priests and nuns, the cost of education increased. And with fewer priests and religious in the classroom, the small everyday symbols, like the religious habit or the Roman collar, started to be seen less and less. And the small intangibles that are hard to articulate, but that are passed on when interacting regularly with people who dedicate their whole lives to the Lord, diminished too. But second, and perhaps more controversially, Catholics started to succeed in America. Young Ital again, these are reasons why uh, Catholic education changed. Catholics started to succeed in America. Young Italian Catholics started moving out of their little Italys to become more integrated with mainstream American culture. The same happened for other immigrant families. They didn't have the same connection to their fatherland as their parents and grandparents did. 
They were no longer interested in the old ways. And because the Catholic schools were quite good, they were staffed, after all, by well-trained priests and nuns, they were able to find success in the world. And with their success and integration, they wanted to, to get out of the ghettos and better integrated into the mainstream, too. Here, I think we can think of the tremendously, tremendously influential long-time president of America's flagship Catholic university, the University of Notre Dame, Father Ted Hesburgh. Uh, many of you are likely familiar with him. If you don't recognize the name, especially when you look at this picture here from the Civil Rights Movement, uh, you see that priest marching next to Martin Luther King Jr. That was Father Ted. Father Ted, along with people like Billy Graham, was also an advisor to presidents and even Pope Paul VI. Father Ted was wildly influential in both church and state. But what Father Ted is perhaps most celebrated for, and sometimes not so celebrated for, is leading the charge in making Notre Dame University and Catholic education what it is today. Of course, I don't want to overstate his contribution, but it was indeed massive. And what did he do? He helped integrate Catholic education into the country's already established schools and universities. <clears throat> Historians of Catholic education, including Father William Miss Campbell, who is a member of Father Ted's religious community and professor of history at Notre Dame, attribute Father Ted's drive to integrate Catholic education to his experience giving a lecture at Yale University. While talking to uh, an audience at Yale, Father Ted began to expound on the moral principles of the Catholic Church, and the audience, instead of celebrating him, hissed him to silence, like a hiss. <laughs> According to Father Miss Campbell, this experience had a massive impact on Father Ted. To be shamed publicly by students at one of the Amer major American universities of his day made him gun-shy about some of the distinguishing features of Catholic identity and morality. Miss Campbell also suggests that events like this gave Father Ted what could be called Ivy Envy. In other words, it motivated a young Father Ted to earn the respect of the elite academic institutions of the day, especially the Ivy League schools. He was not simply interested in a Catholic school that would form the whole human being, he wanted Notre Dame and other Catholic institutions to be elite. Again, it's important to remember how Catholicism was changing in the mid-20th century. Catholicism was moving from a ghettoized culture to integration within the mainstream. And Catholics were leading the charge to become even more integrated. They wanted badly to be just like everyone else. To put it in yet another way, and to bring us back to our opening question, why Catholic education? The goal of mid-20th century Catholicism was not so much to articulate what made Catholic schools distinct, as is often the case today. Then, the goal was to show how Catholic education was like the contemporary world. In 1937, a few years before Father Ted's famous Yale address, the president of the University of Chicago, Robert Maynard Hutchins, in a talk delivered to the meeting of the National Catholic Education Association, celebrated Catholic education as the longest intellectual tradition of any institution in the contemporary world. What a statement this is uh, from a very powerful and influential, though secular, thought leader. And how true his statement is and this should be a point of pride for all of us who are in Catholic education. But the, the Catholic Church, through its monasteries and cathedral schools, built what today we know as the university and the school system. But in his following remarks, uh, the president of the University of Chicago chastised Catholic educators for having imitated the worst features of secular education and ignored most of the good ones. He thought Catholic schools imitated the, wor the world of secular education, especially focused on practical matters, and ignored some of the best, most notably the rigors of the intellectual life. Hutchins uh, would go on to encourage leaders of Catholic institutions to imitate their secular or Protestant counterparts. And perhaps Hutchins was right. Father Ted certainly thought so. 
as did many other Catholic leaders of the day. So what happened? Many sponsoring religious groups changed the way they related to their schools and universities. They gave up ownership of their institutions for lay-run boards. Hiring practices changed too. Administrators started looking for teachers and scholars that were the best and the brightest in their fields, the best biologist, the best literary scholar, the best philosopher, rather than the one who was most supportive or in sync with their mission. And again, not to kick a dead horse, this wasn't just happening in Catholic schools. It was a trend in American Catholicism more generally. Throughout the church, there was a persistent sense that the bastions of Catholicism that made it insular and self-referential had to be raised. We should focus, we should not focus on what makes us distinct, but we should find commonality so as to be integrated. And not only that, Catholic schools and all institutions ought to be as good as, if not better than, their secular counterparts. And nowhere was this felt more strongly than in the United States. That's Hutchins. Of course, John F. Kennedy's rise to the presidency as the first Catholic president of the United States was the culmination of American Catholics' movement out of the ethnic neighborhoods to an integration into mainstream society. Still insecure about anti-Catholic bigotry, Kennedy's statements about separation in church and state solidified this integration mentality. Here and throughout his famous speech, he de-emphasized de the distinctiveness of being Catholic in order to promote a common American brotherhood. The emphasis on integration and lack of interest on pointing out distinctiveness defined a generation of Catholics in this country, even into the church and its clergy. The question why Catholic schools did not carry with it the same urgency or force then as it does now. So what happened? Why is this question now on the mind of Catholic schools administrators everywhere? Clearly, the Catholic Church had to open up to the modern world, as the Second Vatican Council certainly made updating the language of the Church to reach a contemporary audience a major priority. In some sense, it must remain a priority today. But perhaps one could argue that the incessant need to integrate into modern society, along with Catholic school Ivy Envy, was too optimistic to the point of being naive. Perhaps it could also be said that these integrating tax tactics and ivy, ivy envy went too far. Of course, arguing for such a position is likely irresponsible because we can't know what things would have been like had this integration mindset not gone so far. We can't rewind time and replay it with different mindset. So to argue such a thing can't be backed by good data. We can only move forward. But today, Catholic schools are being forced to at once maintain some of this integrationist impulse while now taking a, talking about what makes them unique and distinct. After all, from a business perspective, Catholic schools need to be competitive in the market. And any marketing campaign is about what makes the product special, unique, or distinct. In other words, most, most Catholic schools today have the task of convincing parents and in higher education students why it makes sense to spend many more thousand dollars to attend a Catholic school rather than, than to attend a state-funded education. Most Catholic schools in this country are funded primarily through enrollment or the number of students that attend the school. The only exceptions to this are schools with large endowments. And by large, I mean for a college the size of uh, St. Norbert College in Green Bay, endowments in the billions. It should be no surprise then that many Catholic schools across the country started subtly billing themselves as elite private schools. What does this look like? It means that marketing campaigns emphasize that a large percentage of Catholic school alumni go, go on to college. Or it looks like leading with the opportunity to engage special advanced placement or interla international baccalaureate programs that give students an opportunity to gain college credit while still in college. They market themselves as college prep, schools that help students get ahead in life, or as we see here, academic achievement being first in the list of, uh, of qualities of a school. 
And because Catholic education can be expensive, it makes sense that marketing is often aimed at the people who have the money to pay. This is especially true on the East Coast where Catholic high schools are incredibly expensive. For example, Archmere Academy, the Norbertine High School in Delaware, costs $32,000 a year for the 2023-2024 academic year. That is almost the double, double the cost of most state colleges in the Midwest. The Norbertine High School in Green Bay, Wisconsin, costs significantly less, of course, more than four times less expensive, uh, and is, uh, but even that is still a lot of money for families trying to make ends meet. And financial aid is often generous for those who can't pay, and even better, schools' choice programs have made a big difference in allowing low-income families to send their children to Catholic schools. In Wisconsin, this makes a big difference and has allowed our high school to serve immigrant populations in a way that we couldn't have if we had to charge full price. Of course, most Catholic elementary and high schools can get away with emphasizing their elite college prep status over all else, especially when the Catholic schools are the only private schools in town. Catholic colleges and universities or Catholic high schools in larger cities uh, and larger cities often don't have the same luxury. These schools and colleges are not the only private schools in town. They need to find another way to emphasize their distinctness. For example, Harvard and Princeton are both private universities. Why pick Notre Dame University over Harvard and Princeton? This is where the importance of mission distinctiveness becomes most important. And just to be clear, I don't intend to suggest that Catholic schools that lead their marketing campaigns with words like college prep or such things don't also try to emphasize their Catholic identity. Of course they do. And they do this not just to put butts in the seats. The church has a vested interest in assuring that Catholic schools provide a culture of faith and learning to educate the next generation of Catholics and perhaps even to familiarize non-Catholics with the goodness, truth, and beauty that exist in the Catholic Church. After all, Catholic schools don't exist to make anyone rich. No one is making a lot of money off of Catholic schools. Catholic schools emphasize their distinct religious mission to give glory to God. Nevertheless, in some contexts, how to market mission distinctiveness remains controversial. If we are too Catholic, Will we scare away certain non-religious or nominally religious families away? If we aren't Catholic enough, will Catholic middle-class families that aren't necessarily looking for an elite college prep education for their children, but instead looking for their kids to be immersed in Catholic culture, still fork up the extra money to send their children to a Catholic school? In other words, in an age of decreased Sunday Mass attendance, and with younger families losing their cultural ties to the Catholic Church, is a school's Catholic identity a liability or an asset? It's a difficult and awkward question to ask for committed Catholics who want Catholic education to succeed, but it's a question that cannot be ignored. And yet, perhaps it can be ignored in some sense. After all, as I just mentioned, Catholic schools don't exist for self-preservation. They don't exist for their own sake. They exist to glorify God and serve his people. And therefore, Catholic identity isn't really a negotiable aspect of a Catholic school's mission. In a couple of somewhat recent YouTube videos, Bishop Robert Barron has uh, uh, even argued that if Catholic schools cease living up to their Catholic mission, they should simply close, for they are no longer fulfilling their purpose. I highly recommend some of these videos, he makes a compelling argument that I won't go too much further into. But another question follows from this. What does it mean to be a Catholic school? What does it mean to celebrate Catholic identity or treat it as an asset rather than a liability? Does it simply mean that students are required to attend a daily mass once a month? Does it mean that right before the Pledge of Allegiance in the morning that we say in Our Father, after all, biology is still biology, whether it's at a Catholic school or a Mormon school or a public school. Two plus two still equals four, no matter which school one attends. 
The question is highlighted even more within Catholic universities and colleges, where students are more independent. In other words, one can usually get through four years of college without having to attend any religious services or events. Does Catholic identity on a Catholic campus simply mean that there is a priest chaplain on campus? Of course, secular colleges and universities have Newman centers where there can be robust Catholic community and culture. This is Texas A&M Newman Center, which is packed with students every Sunday, a public school for a public tuition. Does it mean, then, if we can find these things at public schools, University of Wisconsin-Madison also has a very robust uh, Catholic population, uh, does it mean that a theology and philosophy course is required in the core curriculum? Is that all that makes a Catholic college Catholic? So why Catholic schools? What makes Catholic education distinct? And even more, how do we highlight the distinctiveness of Catholic education while avoiding the errors of 19th century Catholic education and make Catholic education overly self-referential, overly isolationist, and as something that is pitted aggressively against the contemporary world? To answer this question, the, the answers to these questions are varied, and it remains a vibrant debate that is heavily discussed both within Catholic parochial and high schools, uh, and especially within Catholic colleges and universities that really need to find that value proposition to uh, find students. And one of the first areas that many uh, schools point to as a possible answer is ethics. What makes Catholic schools distinct? Instead of just creating the business leaders of tomorrow, we make ethical business leaders. Catholic schools produce ethical people who will fight for social justice, who will lead through service, and who will not just chase a paycheck, but be interested in lifting up the poor and the marginalized. Catholic schools do indeed produce such graduates, and this should be a source of pride for all who have invested in Catholic education. And this kind of ethical thinking which is often marketed as having a focus on Catholic social teaching and the dignity of every human person, can indeed be infused across the curriculum. Biologists can talk about medical and environmental ethics. Business classes can talk about the dangers of usury and unjust and predatory business practices. Lifting up ethics as a point of distinction for Catholic schools on the surface sounds like a great option. This is especially true because it's easy to sell. Who doesn't think being ethical is a good thing? Such a strategy would likely receive buy-in from a wide range of people, and it would be relatively non-offensive to non-Catholics, both families who would attend our schools and, sometimes more importantly, employees who we need to hire to teach within our institutions. However, in 1937, when Robert Maynard Hutchins, the president of the University of Chicago, celebrated Catholic education as the longest intellectual tradition of any institution in the contemporary world, he wasn't referring primarily to moral theology or philosophical ethics. Of course, it includes moral theology, but ethics was not the distinguishing characteristic of Catholic schools throughout the centuries. He was talking about something more. After all, I personally am a product of two secular schools, one public and one private. Both, both schools openly and freely talked about social ethics. The language may have been slightly different, but it was all there. When I studied biology in graduate school, we were warned about using evolutionary biology to justify racism and eugenics. In literature classes in my public high school, we studied the ethical implications of characters' actions and how that shaped their character arcs. In history classes, I was trained to remember that it was always the victors who get to write the history books and to pay attention to the marginalized voices that aren't as clearly articulated. Equity, diversity, and inclusion were words that permeated the culture of these institutions. I'm not convinced that ethics is the right answer about what makes Catholic colleges, universities, high schools distinct. However, even if we do decide that ethics is the right answer to why Catholic schools, we can't help recognize that this is not an accurate representation 
of the essence of what Catholicism is or has to offer the world. Surely the world would be, better, would be a better place if all business and governments and institutions bought into Catholic social teaching, no question. But this view is also reductionistic. Understanding Catholic identity as ethics could be easily adopted by the deists of the modern period. I'm sure we've all heard of the Jefferson Bible, which is a great example of the Christianity as ethics way of thinking. The deists tried to make Christianity respectable to the Enlightenment world by cutting out the passages of scripture that have to do with the miraculous and its metaphysical claims in favor of simple ethical teaching. And so Thomas Jefferson literally did just that. He took a Bible and literally cut out those passages that were disagreeable or even, to his mind, embarrassing to the Enlightenment world. This kind of over-integrationist thinking trying to make Christianity favorable to the world, far surpasses some of the excesses of the mid to late 20th century Catholic education. But if ethics can't be the why in the why Catholic schools question, then what can? Allow me to read uh, quickly from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. As they continued their journey, Jesus entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat beside the Lord at his feet listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving? Tell her to help me. The Lord said to her in reply, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. Of course, this is a famous passage. From the simple reading of the passage, we see a contrast between the life of action, characterized by Martha, who is burdened by serving the Lord, and contemplation, embodied by Mary, who simply sits at the Lord's feet and listens. It's a story that answers an ever-ancient, ever-new debate about what a good life looks like. Is a life defined by service, work, or ethics? Or is the good life defined by leisure, study, and, competition, and contemplation? As a fun fact, uh, perhaps you're already aware that this story has great roots in the Norbertine tradition. In the mid-12th century, shortly after St. Norbert founded the order, there was a raging debate between traditional monks, Benedictines to be precise, and the new group of canons regular, like the Norbertines. The monks spent their days within the cloister, attending to prayer and a life of contemplation, and the Germanic side of the Norbertine order was often actively engaged in the apostolate. And the question was, which life is higher? Which is a more godly life? Today, this sounds like a superfluous debate, something that children would have. Today, we might sound, uh, if you can excuse the language, like a pissing contest. But the results of this debate had real-world consequences in the 12th century. Because in the Middle Ages, if a member of a religious order wanted to change religious orders, he could only move to a higher way of life. That was the only way he was able to receive permission. So which religious order had a higher way of life really mattered. The monks appealed to this story to say that they were higher. The monks said that they were like Mary. They were the ones who spent their lives in contemplation of the divine mysteries. The canons, the Norbertines, they said, were like Martha. Communities of priests, they were too busy, caught up in the apostolate, out in parishes and such. Therefore, monastic life was superior to Norbertine life. But in the 12th century, uh, a famous Norbertine named Father Anselm of Havelberg wrote back a snarky letter to the Benedictines. He said, yes, Benedictines, you are indeed like Mary. You spend your days in contemplation of the divine mysteries. You sit at the Lord's feet and you hang on his every word. But we, Norbertines, are not like Martha. You see, within the story, the Norbertines are represented by Christ the teacher. This was kind of a gotcha moment. 
pulled it away from being just Mary versus Martha to Mary and Christ. Uh, of course, if you are being represented by Christ, you are the highest, uh, highest uh, religious order. It's from here that St. Norbert College got its motto, to teach by word and example, from this same principle. And because the Norbertines were represented by Christ, and because Christ is more important than Mary, the Norbertines had a higher form of life. That's a little side story. But this, the story of Mary and Martha is an answer to an ancient debate that always continues on. The Greeks, led by Plato and Aristotle, believed that contemplation was the highest activity a human being could engage in. The Romans, in all their statecraft, believed that action was most important and that to live a life of contemplation was to be lazy. The modern era thought the same thing. Contemplation was worthless. This is one reason why the French dissolved all the monasteries during and after the French Revolution, because all the contemplation was a waste of resources. And this action-oriented mindset continues on today. How do we know that this continues? Think about this. When you have a day all to yourself, when you have no responsibilities, what do you call that day? What is the name most people in America give to a free day to do with whatever one pleases. Most would call it a day off. And a day off from what? Work. You see, in the contemporary period, we define our time by work, not by leisure, not by feast days, not by our prayer, but by work. Joseph Pieper calls this total work in his book on leisure. We live in an era when work dominates the way we understand ourselves, our time, and our purpose. But this was not always so. You'll notice that as I went through the major eras of the West, I left out Christendom. Christendom, the era from which the modern school and university came to be, was defined not by work, but by contemplation. It was Mary-centric rather than Martha-centric. It was the age in which the monasteries were the center of civilization, the monasteries, these men and women who spent most of their days in prayer and holy reading, built Western civilization after the fall of Rome. Does this mean they refrained from work? No. But the major cities of the West were built around cathedrals and monasteries. It wasn't work that defined their days, but the ringing of the church bells, the Angelus bells, which brought people to prayer. The days were centered around liturgical seasons and feasts, not work. It was a different world. It was this milieu that the president of the University of Chicago was referring to when he celebrated Catholic education as the longest intellectual tradition of any institution in the contemporary world. And when he chastised Catholic schools for imitating the worst features of secular education, especially an over-focus on getting people jobs, action, instead of rigorous speculative and contemplative thought. Of course, in our Martha-esque world, even in theology, we often make fun of the speculative habits of the medieval tradition. They focus too much on counting the number of angels on the head of a pin, rather than on the more important things, like social or political ethics. But what does this mean for Catholic schools? Does this mean that we abandon the trades? We stop training people for business? We force all our curricula into a liberal arts or great books format? Of course, I don't think so. Preparing people for action, whether in terms of work or ethics, remains incredibly important. It remains an imperative. I argue, though, that what ought to make Catholic education distinct today is what has made it distinct for 1,500 years, and that is the Mary-esque over the Martha-esque. Contemplation first, followed by action. Before applying this directly to Catholic schools, let's first define what it means in the Christian tradition. Of course, this term is used differently by different people in different contexts, but what does it mean classically? Contemplation is an act of the intellect, of our minds. To put it more simply, it's a type of thinking. We don't contemplate with our senses, we don't contemplate with our wills, or with our appetites or emotions. Surely these other parts play a part, but the core of the contemplative act comes through the intellect. 
And this is one of the reasons why throughout the centuries, both the Greek and the Catholic traditions, by Greek I mean ancient Greek and, and the Catholic tradition, have emphasized contemplation as the highest, most important thing a human being can do. It's because our intellect is what makes us most human. As humans, we are defined by our rational capacity, and thus it's through the intellect that we come to apprehend the world and eventually find happiness. After all, the good life is traditionally defined as living according to our nature and to our ends. And by living a life of the intellect, then, we engage the part of ourselves that makes us who we are, and therefore we find happiness. But as we know, there are many different ways of using our intellects. St. Thomas Aquinas distinguishes between two, ratio, or reason, and intellectus, which is a kind of intuition. We can think of ratio as a discursive way of thinking, like thinking about something. It's a way of thinking that implies study or making sense of something, uh, and so on. Intellectus, on the other hand, is simple intuition. It's more like seeing something holistically and simply. It's seeing something for what it is. You can imagine being in the Sistine Chapel and looking up at the ceiling uh, in Rome, and you can do one of two things. You can look, look at it through the eyes of analysis and study, ratio, or you can take note, or you can just let it soak into you. You can look at it in an intuitive sense, intellectus. You see the thing as a whole, letting the image wash over you. This is the difference between ratio and intellectus. And this is the difference between what the Christian tradition calls meditation and what it calls contemplation. St. Thomas in the Summa quotes Richard of St. Victor and says this, Contemplation is the soul's clear and free dwelling upon the object of its gaze. Meditation is the survey of the mind while occupied in the search for truth. Meditation, ratio, mulling over something. Contemplation, viewing through intuition. We should note that this is often different in how these words are sometimes used in Christian circles today, especially around centering prayer, which can be a different, uh, people also call it contemplative prayer. I'm not speaking of it in this sense of emptying out a mind, uh, but here it's about filling the mind uh, uh, through first meditatio, which gives, or meditation, which gives rise to intuition, meditation to contemplation. Therefore, when we talk about making Catholic education more distinctive, by, by emphasizing contemplation throughout a curriculum, we're really thinking about a way of approaching reality. It's not just about facts or about rhetoric, speaking or writing well, or being polished socially and culturally. It's about a way of seeing, but not with our eyes, but with our minds. This was the goal of Catholic education for centuries. It's the traditional understanding of education. It's only relatively recently in the grand scope of things that education has shifted its purpose to focus on job preparation. Surely the question needs to be raised, what does an emphasis on contemplation actually look like? All of this seems kind of abstract or pie in the sky. I think the first place to start to help things, uh, help things become more com concrete is to focus on the big questions of life. And by big questions, I mean the basic and most fundamental questions of life. Why is there something rather than nothing? What is the purpose of life? What makes a human being a human being? How am I supposed to make sense of death? Does God exist and what does it matter? What of truth and goodness and beauty? These are big fundamental questions that are at once simple and yet terrifyingly complex. They are simple, which means that everyone, from time to time, must wrestle with them if they are alive and thinking. But they're terribly complex, which means that they can be hard to talk about, and thus they can be hard to teach. But it was these questions that entertained the minds of scholars of the Catholic tradition. And to ask these questions is to start on the life of contemplation. They make our minds ruminate on what we know, meditation which then gives right way to intuitive ways of seeing the world, contemplation. 
However, in many contemporary curricula, the, mo curricula, the most important basic questions of life and existence can sometimes be sidelined in favor of questions with clearer answers. And sometimes students are confronted only with books that were written in the past 70 years with their action-oriented focus and emphasis on current, present cultural and political realities. This can even be true in theology classes, which in some places has turned simply into political ethics classes with theological language, rather than encouraging the contemplation of God himself and the sacred mysteries. As a side note, um, a wise Dominican priest, he's actually a bishop from the East Coast province, once said that you could tell which priests had a contemplative habit by the way they preached. In their homilies, they open up the sacred mysteries as opposed to reducing all of scripture to ethics. Anyways, so the idea here is that if we just look at theology as ethics, we draw only ethics from the scriptures. We're making that same error that Jefferson did, and we're losing something. The contemplative habit helps us open up the sacred mysteries, both in the scriptures and in the world as well. Anyways, returning to how theology is sometimes taught, it sometimes tend to focus on technical, complex debates with less consequence than the big questions. Questions like Markan priority or Matthean priority and whether a Q source exists can take precedence over the big questions in life. Of course, understanding these more technical questions is important. I don't mean to suggest they're not. What I do mean to suggest is that approaching these smaller questions ought to be explicitly oriented towards the larger ones and the larger questions ought to be given the time proportionate to their importance. And this isn't simply because we want to train students to think about the highest things, though we certainly do. By wrestling with these questions, by teaching and reinforcing the importance of contemplation to a good life, a life well lived, we also enter the realm of evangelization. Let me give you an example. About 50 years ago, a few professors started a program at the University of Kansas, a secular college, called the Integrated Humanities Program. Students read great books that spanned through the centuries, and that asked the big questions of life. They also engaged in extracurricular activities like stargazing, just laying on their backs looking up at the stars. Anyone who has ever had, who has ever taken the time to stargaze on a cool, dark summer night, knows that such an activity can't help but force us to ask the big questions. The program only listed, lasted for 10 years, and it was controversially closed. But within those 10 years, there were many conversions to the Catholic faith, even though this wasn't being taught from a Catholic position. And many priests and religious vocations were inspired. All of this, and currently Clear Creek Monastery in Oklahoma, is made up of a bunch of these graduates. It was founded by these graduates. All of these coming from the University of Kansas, which is a secular university, during a time when Catholic colleges and universities struggled to have similar effect. Also, shortly before resigning from his pontificate, Pope Benedict XVI was asked how to bring people to the faith. The Holy Father did not respond by encouraging the study of apologetics or through proselytization. He simply encouraged his questioner to ask the big questions of life. By asking and wrestling with these questions through a contemplative approach to the world, Pope Benedict thought that people would be confronted with an encounter with God and that that encounter would open doors to faith. At this point, you probably are noticing a heavy emphasis on the humanities with little attention to the more technical STEM disciplines. But even if you're not noticing that, I'm a biologist and so I notice it, but one of the important aspects of a contemplative mindset is the recognition of what St. John Henry Newman called the unity of knowledge. All knowledge is one because there is one truth and one reality. What does this mean? It means that when I study biology, I don't study it in an isolation chamber. It's connected to philosophy and theology and political science and ethics. Likewise, when I study math, I'm not studying something that is disconnected from biology or philosophy or so forth. The truth is what unites the disciplines. And ultimately, as Catholics, we believe that God is the capital T truth. He is the truth itself. 
how common it is to sit in a biology class and zero in on facts around mitochondria and cell membranes, and then go to computer science class and learn how to code in Python, and then in civics class and learn about the branches of government. This compartmentalization of knowledge can easily lead to a student losing the fundamental truth of its unity. But with an emphasis on contemplation, a student becomes acutely aware of the unity of biology and math and computer science and ultimately come to see them in a relationship to the truth itself, who is God. It brings seemingly disparate areas of knowledge together as a whole and helps us to see the world through a new, more in intuitive lens. To conclude, uh, let us once again return to the question we started with, why Catholic education? In this talk, I tried to help us feel the weight of the question, its importance, and some of the controversial questions around it. With admittedly overly broad strokes, I argue that this question wasn't a pressing one in our country in the 19th and early 20th century, but that it was self-evident. And through the middle of the 20th century, it perhaps even became the wrong question to ask, with the bigger question being, how do we become like everyone else? But now that Catholic schools have been integrated into the mainstream, become more expensive, and some even having experienced some mission drift, Catholic schools are facing pressure to articulate what makes them distinct in order to compete with other private schools, but also to stay faithful to their mission. I also mentioned that articulating the distinctiveness of Catholic education can be difficult, especially if we're trying to reach a broad audience. A secular education with a monthly all-school mass and a theology requirement attached on the side is a distinct way, but it doesn't speak to a compellingly distinct educational experience, one that uh, Hutchins spoke about. I then propose an emphasis on a, contemplat on a contemplative habit as an area that can be further developed to showcase the distinctiveness of Catholic education while showing its potential evangelizing power. Of course, much more could be said about contemplation within Catholic schools. And from my point of view, it appears to be an underappreciated or understudied aspect of our tradition, and one that was really important to the development of the Western educational system to begin with. But in an era where action and ethics is prioritized over contemplation, the world and the church needs contemplatives to raise and speak eloquently about the big questions of life. Because when we speak about the big questions of life, there we come to encounter God. Thank you very much. All right, folks, questions? Well, I, I think one question I have is, uh, you know, having now gone through most of the semester of teaching, Secular University uh, about Catholicism in Latin America, and you know, just talking in sort of an, an analytical way about things like liberation theology. One of the, the the thoughts that came to mind ultimately is that you know when you look at, for example, the later branches of liberation theology, I can think of somebody like Yvonne Guevara would be uh, would come to mind. Is that there does seem to be thread even among some. Catholic, you know, clergy and religious that, you know, ultimately, and I suppose this is part of a kind of a, a classic practical theology uh, movement, um, that the urgent questions, uh, you know, confronting humanity, a lot of things that deal with like you know, social justice, economic justice, politics, war, and things like that, that at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, theology has to be in service of some sort of social movement, but that ultimately at the same time, then you know, questions about the sense of truth, you know, the, the, you know, the big questions about you know, what humanity's mission is and so forth, humanity's relationship to God, the nature of God and so forth, that it's almost as if that becomes, you know, it's like we have the leisure to talk about that sort of thing, we will, but you know, when it comes to quote unquote important things, that is the adult world, then we, we kind of set that aside and then we focus on human solutions to human problems. And so I guess the question I would have for you or just you know asking for commentary is, 
because you mentioned that you know also the, the, this notion of evangelization is is part of perhaps the Catholic you know education mission, especially in higher education, that you know, this the notion of truth being knowable, discovering truth that that is part of the mission that even with these most fundamental questions, things like climate change, things, you know, like you know, injustice, wars, what's going on in Israel and Palestine and so forth, that if we, you know, attempt either by omission or commission to cut God out of that conversation, then in a sense something has already been lost. Uh, so that would be, I guess, you know, my, my comment, my question, and I'm just curious to see how you would respond to that. Yeah, just to clarify, are you, uh, the second part of your question, you were saying, you were saying if we cut God out of these questions. Yeah, that the sense that at the end of the day, uh, when you start thinking about, for example, like you know, questions of, of, yeah. of liberation and fighting social injustice, but when the focus becomes, I think there was a, a critique, for example, that John Paul II, I think as well as Benedict, that the time Carl Ratzinger made of, of liberation theology, and they said that the problem that they saw was that when is the notion of redemption you know, yeah. that is, that from Jesus Christ when that was then replaced with liberation. Right. In that, and so that theology at that point, there was a shift that it then became just you know another implement of the service of whether you call, you call it class warfare, you can call it right, right. search for you know, sort of a perfect humanism, whatever, that something really was damaged. So yeah. that, that's kind of where I was going with that. Yeah, I, I think something was that. I mean, it goes back to the French and this, the dissolution of the monasteries for the same reason. Like, what are you doing if you're not... Uh, you know, I think one of the, the bigger questions that rises from this is how, e if we focus on ethics first, how quickly how quickly we can lose our the principles which undergird ethics. This gets back to the big debate between Gustavo Gutierrez and Cardinal Ratzinger, the orthodoxy versus orthopraxy debate which comes first with Ratzinger insisting that orthodoxy came first and Gustavo Gutierrez at the time saying no orthopraxis comes first and then you reflect on it later um, and of course Ratzinger said very straightforwardly if you don't know God how can you a act well basically I mean not that secular people can act well with thinking but it's through contemplative thought that we gain our principles to then move forward into action so I think that that'd be a big first step and I think part of it is you know even with the, the the monasteries kind of building the West some of that came through their action they had farms but it was through the the contemplative side that brought life to a community and so if you reduce everything to ethics you lose your principles in a sense it's funny because Father Thomas Joseph White who's now the rector of the Angelicum in Rome went to Duke University <coughs> to give a talk uh, to some of the theologians there, and afterwards, one of them said, "Wow, this is actually theology. It's the first time they've heard nice. talk about like God and what is what is what is the incarnation. What is like these basic concepts that I mean, imagine the concept like incarnation that has so many ethical implications, right? Yeah. But if you focus first on the issue and not first on the incarnation, how can you make that application? So I, I think there's a it's not that we shouldn't think ethically. We need to think ethically. God wants us to think ethically and to act ethically. It's the question of where's the primacy. And I think, I think contemplation helps push action forward, not the opposite. If you put action first, you stifle everything. Yes? Yeah, um, thank you, Father, for your contribution. So um, I have a question. So um, you mentioned um, that during the late um, you know, modern days that the laws and peace were very much relevant you know, in the education sector. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something about um, symbolism of um, you know, the clerical outfit, you know, the um, habit, the cut off, and the Roman color. And I also remember um, growing up you know, um, as a young Sumerian getting that impression that Sumerians must Traditional, you know, position because um, I've 
hard um, a teacher who said that in the American culture, it is difficult for someone to approach you to ask about you know, theoretical discussions while you are in your habit. While um, you know, some persons also feel that some persons you know, feel that you can you know, actually you know, take people back or flatten you just by your mere representation of yeah. you know, an ecclesiastical you know, entity itself. Yeah, uh, I, I understand both sides of that, that concern. I, I think I especially understand the side of the concern where like an eager an, an eager seminarian who wants that authority might rush in wearing something to in order to show off versus something else. It has not been my ex- I, I I will say that as a I wear my habit when I teach. I wear my habit. I wore my habit out at in my graduate school uh, when I wasn't in the field a lot. I found great openness all the time. I do recognize that there's sometimes people are don't understand and are scared about it, but I've, I've found great openness and people encouraging, especially younger people, seem interested in it. I, I think there, my experience is that it's not always been the case with some older generations of Catholics, but I think there's just different experiences that people have had. But I, I firmly believe that, that allowing the public to see a young person in a wearing religious, wearing symbols of the faith, whether it's a cross, a habit, whatever, is powerful. Because I, I think there are a lot of people who think there are no young people who are committed to the Lord. And I think it's just a symbol. Of course, there's great dangers with, I mean, the rule of St. Augustine warns us against, against being provocative, uh, like doing it to be provocative. So I think w- whenever the habit or the collar comes into discussion, we have to check our hearts to make sure that they're in the right place and that we're doing this from a place of confidence in who we are and love for the Lord and not a place of clericalism or a place of trying to gain authority. But I, at St. Norbert today, most of the Norbertines um, wear our habits on campus uh, and wear it without, without awkwardness, I guess. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, in reference to what you are saying about orthodoxy and orthopraxy, you know? Yep. Um, so I wish to, you know, recount a theory on the standpoint, it's a theological theory, that says um, that our foundation, exposure, and experiences actually influence our perspective. Yep. So you are trying to, you know, um, mediate between, you know, um, faith and reason and which one comes first. And it appears that you are trying to present you know, faith or contemplation to stand in the front while the actions you know, um, follow behind. I mean, I start to be corrected, but I think it was St. Augustine that was talking about you know, the Fernandes Seminaris, meaning that God has implanted in man the gift of reason. And I am wondering why didn't he mention about faith? You know, uh, I know faith is there, but um, in his philosophy, he wasn't trying to place you know, faith to be paramount because he believed that with the reason, you can actually achieve you know, faith or other words. So I mentioned this because regarding education, I think this is somehow um, regional, but focusing on American culture, I would say that if the Catholic um, education or the Catholic school should focus more on you know, the basis of faith, you know, as opposed to other words you know, of society or other you know, um, social justice and you know, ideologies, I think um, it will go far. But I think people are more attracted when a religious institute like the Catholic schools are more concerned or project more um, you know, issues that are more you know, realistic and particular to people. So how do you talk about inequality or poverty or injustice, you know, and then you try to present God in the midst of all this. But I think when the church is more concerned about all those you know, um, political or economic or social you know, concepts, and people see that, oh, the, the schools or the Catholic you know, church is actually in support of this, it draws more people to the church and also in connection to the schools. 
you know, I think um, also from my own perspective, I can't imagine, you know, coming from a particular um, culture where the concern is on politics, and then I am hearing a pastor or, you know, a Catholic, you know, teacher talking more about God. You know, for instance, the Catholic Church uh, is somehow very much against, you know, um, partisan politics, especially when the clergy or Catholic priests are involved. But in the history of Nigeria, between last year and this year, for the first time we see Catholic schools, Catholic bishops and priests becoming partisan because they feel like things have gotten to a worse extent. But the question is, what could have happened if originally Catholic schools did not establish you know, more of moral principles, something actionable than starting with faith? One thing I should make clear is that I'm not suggesting that we should not be vocal with our ethics. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting that we be very vocal with our ethics. What I'm saying is that that shouldn't be the, the number one selling point or the distinction point between a Catholic education and not. So, right, I, 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 I think Catholic schools should take a ton of pride in all the stances they take and in all the, the service that they do. Um, so it's in no way meant to minimize ethics. What I was talking about when I'm talking about ethic, action, and contemplation is an emphasis point. Where, what, what really makes it different uh, than another school? In other words, and, and I think the question is re a real one, in my secular educational institutions, they also took hard stands on ethical issues and fought hard and did a lot of service. So what, I, what I'm really looking for here is something that makes, what makes Catholic education unique? That's not to say we shouldn't do everything else. We should. Um, that's one point. I think your point on faith and reason. So I, I'm not sure I completely understood, but let me just take a stab. So one of the things that I think is important to remember is that Catholic schools are still schools. And so when I, when I mention contemplation, remember I emphasize that this is an act of the intellect. I'm talking about reason, using reason that gives way to, to an intellectus, ratio to intellectus. This is part of our rational faculty. So I'm not trying to split faith and reason apart. Faith is a supernatural gift. It's not something natural to man. So even somebody like St. Augustine uh, would have argued that, at least especially later on in his life. When he was young and a philosopher before he kind of converted to Christianity, he had a greater... He was a little bit naive about the role of grace, but he became the doctor of grace because he said that faith is a gift from God and not something that I can get to through reason. Um, so I, I don't want to paint a picture either of contemplation against action. I know I put it one versus the other in this talk, but uh, again, that was only as a distinction point. I do think that the contemplative aspect is critical before we start opening our mouths about ethics. And I think that's going to be something that I have to stand by, even if it's more attractive to buy into culture war issues and just kind of say, well, we're going to be against this controversial issue. And that might attract some people, but that's not the heart of what the Christian intellectual tradition is. It's about first understanding and first contemplating the truth and from that truth going out boldly into action. So I don't want to, I still don't, even though I, under, I hear you in saying, Ethics and political action is what will be attractive and can get more people to come. Just because it's attractive doesn't mean make it right in my in my mind. Does that make sense? So we, I, th I still think there's a there's a there's an intellectual honesty in making sure we think th through things before we act. Is kind of the idea. Yes. Yeah. Beyond contemplate, beyond rational thinking, because my understanding is that to take the contemplative practices, to 
takes you out of yourself into a place that's limitless rather than an intellectual understanding. Right, you're right. Um, you're right. And uh, th part of the difficulty here is is different ways it's used. So, like, for example, with the Christian mystics, we would say that con contemplation is also a grace. It's not something that's natural to the, to the human being. So, like, if we're talking about the mysticism of St. Therese or St. Teresa of Avila or John the Cross or any of the great Christian mystics, we would always say contemplation is a grace. It's not something that I can get myself to. It's something that the Lord gives me. There is, so, and that's still true in a sense here, um, but this, what I'm, there's also a, a more secular notion of this contemplation which I'm trying to get at, and which I think St. Thomas even approaches with this distinction between ratio and intellectus, where it's, I want to think about it. So there's, let me just use an example to kind of, to kind of portray this. So uh, G. Evelyn Hutchinson is the father of modern ecology. He's this massive figure in ecology. And he wrote about a time that he observed birds mating on a fence post outside of his house. And how he's a biologist, so he studied these mating behaviors. He, st he knows why they're the color they are because he's studied this. He's done his meditatio. But because all this knowledge came together, migration patterns, all these behavioral things, the type of food they eat that bring out certain coloration. When he saw these two birds on this fence post, he saw it intuitively and kind of had an experience with it. I don't know that I'm willing to call that necessarily like a grace, a supernatural grace to allow him to, to find that enjoyment in the bird. But it's something that is certainly an intuitive way of seeing rather than a rational way of thinking. So I, I think your question is great and I, I really do think that contemplation is often used. There is a form of contemplation where we say, well, this is really only a grace from God. It's God giving this to us. There's another way of using it, which I'm kind of trying to use it here, and which has kind of been used in some Catholic education. Like Father Andrew Saferni, who's in Norbertine from Dalesford, tried to do something like this at St. Norbert College. He was very big on contemplation being one of the four pillars of our... Of our um, and he didn't mean it in the, in the grace sense, more in this uh, intuitive sense. Yes? Right. I'm going to experience there. It's kind of like you do it, and if something comes of it, that's a grace. But it's not with that as the agenda, right. the end point. And I just, you know, we were talking beforehand about teaching kids. I would be wanting to see children learn meditation or contemplation actions small, you know, with small children to get a, not so much experiential God consciousness, but to um, realize their potentiality, that that's their God self. Yeah. They, when they're given the opportunity to have a contemplative practice or a yoga practice or whatever, that calms them they can experience who they are. I see. Essentially. Yeah, and I, I, I think the difference that between, and I, I, I think that's great. I think the, di the difference in the way that we're talking about it is, I think, well, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're, uh, there's two different ways we can understand this contemplation. One is in that very spiritual sense, where it's like, it's a practice 
kind of more in what I was saying that a lot of, um, when I said a lot of contemporary users of the word, words meditation and contemplation. In Catholic sphere, sometimes you can use centering prayer or there's these other forms of prayer that people think of when they think of um, contemplation. I think the contemplation that I'm talking about is slightly different and that what I'm talking about is the more studied, it, a more study-based, like it's, um, it's the way that, uh, yes, the, the way that a medieval monk would, would be doing meditation. It's not emptying the mind and waiting for something to come in. Uh, so that's, that's w what I think, you know, and uh, a lot of the centering prayer in Catholic circles um, with Keating and, and those folks brought in like transcendental meditation from the East. And so, and that kind of has flavored the way that those words are now used in a lot of Catholic circles. The way that I'm, the ones that I'm bringing in are more medieval categories um, that more speaks to meditatio. Meditation is the studying of something. It's filling the mind rather than emptying it. And we fill the mind, and once we learn these things, that can give way to intuitive seeing, uh, either by grace or more simp and when we're talking about like contemplation of the divine, or just more when we're thinking of it more secularly, just a holistic approach to the real. So it's it's a different way of using it, um, and it's a confusing thing. And I, I think these categories have been muddied with centering prayer and then more traditional forms of meditation and contemplation because the words all get jumbled up and it's hard to make those distinctions. But uh, here I'm, I'm not talking about the centering prayer type. I'm talking about the more, the more lexio type and not just, and not even the lexio type, but more of an approach to, to knowledge uh, and things uh, rather than uh, to, um, specifically prayer type exercises. So, so you were thinking that intellectual and can be as big as emptiness. Intellectual from doing whatever practices or, or whatever, you know, just kind of yeah. The opposite, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, this is where the there, there's debates around this. You know, the the via negativa versus the via positiva, uh, filling the the head versus emptying it. You know, the Catholic tradition has 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 very much been in the the tradition of filling the head, um, and it's not just filling it with facts. It's it's trying to make sense of things, trying to make connections. So again, it's not this is a mitochondria, this is a cell wall. How, how does cellular respiration work? It's it's making connections, like the ending part, I, when I was talking about the unity of knowledge, it's trying to make connections to get to a holistic truth. That is the meditatio. It's like when you're praying the rosary, the reason that we meditate on the mysteries is not to empty the head, it's to fill it. We, we don't pray the, the, um, the Hail Marys in order to think nothing. We fill it in order to free our minds to think nothing more deliberately about the mysteries of the Lord. And that meditatio, that, that ratio, that ruminating on the mystery is the traditional form of Catholic, medita Catholic meditation. And then that gives way to an intuitive seeing the reality of appreciating and seeing the reality. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. or something practical, you know, suggestions can you give to maybe a 
a group of you know clergy or seminarians or you know Catholic you know teachers that the TA could actually help them to grow the relevance of you know Catholic education, especially in the contemporary American culture. Huh. I would think start start thinking about kind of start asking the big questions in life. I mean, I think that's I think that's what my hope and takeaway from all this is is focus on what matter the, these big questions first, and from there get to the smaller questions. I think that's that's kind of my big and I think the second part is you know the distinction between study and spirituality has been a dangerous one. It, it's an artificial distinction, and one that the, the great monastic schools before the scholastics came about, those two things were the same. The study of the scriptures was also a spiritual practice. It, it's not like there was this spirituality over here, study over here. I think, I think seeing that those two things would be my advice, I guess. Thanks. Alrighty. Well, before we Ryan, Father Matthew, into the ground. Um, once again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. This is a very serious uh, you know, intellectual offering here. And uh, one of the things I do want to say, I'm going to, I'm going to take advantage of my, my uh, sort of role as MC here just to make a, a comment, and I'll, I'll sort of close with this. Once again, thank you. The Norbertine Library, thanks for coming and doing this. The Obviously, Norbertine Community of Santa Maria de la Vida. Also, on the behalf of Abbot Joel, myself, we thank you. The Spirituality Center certainly thanks you, and I'm sure everybody here thanks you for you know presenting what you had to offer, as well as you know fielding, I think, some very challenging but important questions. And I think the the thing that came to my mind in terms of the valence right now, uh, in, the, in terms of the class I'm teaching, is we've been talking a lot about the Sea Judge Act, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of you know liberation theology versus you know the the sense of when it, when some of these things become. I think you alluded to it a little bit very secularized. Yeah. And I think the, the, the issue for what exactly you presented now, and based on something that I remember you said to me many years ago, that, uh, that Benedict, well, at the time Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger was, was saying, is that, that at, in the postmodern era, we had, had somehow fooled ourselves into belie believing that truth was no longer knowable. Right. And now, and, and indeed, what we're seeing today with all this, the question of misinformation, disinformation, social media, fake news, whatever, you know, the, the, the term that we hear now a lot of times, my truth, this is my truth, that's your truth, I'll, I'll live according to my truth, and that where you have secular universities, in some cases maybe even religious schools, that buy into that. Just, you know, you believe what you're going to believe, I'm going to believe what I'm going to believe, but then when we have something like what's going on in, in Israel, Palestine, and then people don't, the whole going back to the C. Judge Acts, I think this is perhaps what th this notion of contemplation and the Catholic school mission in, of education ha offers is that if if you do believe in the Praxis model, the C. Judge Act reflect, but if you don't know how to interpret what you see, you know, just facticity, you know, to be able to to reflect theologically and then ultimately ethically, where do you go? You know, and that's, and I think that's that's really the issue we find ourselves in is that you, it, we we live in a crisis of epistemology in that respect, and so I think perhaps that would be one of the other selling points with this notion of contemplation or contemplatio, and what makes Catholic unique education not just unique and important, but perhaps essential, maybe yeah. now more than ever. So again, I think this is this is very much the conversation of the moment. Thank you um, for for coming and, and spending some time with us. And uh, so if you're watching at home, uh, please share with your friends. We are going to have one more uh, Catholic education a lecture before the concluding symposium in April. Um, so just stay tuned. We'll have inform more information about that. And also we do have Theology on Film uh, next Thursday at Immaculate Conception Church. So please join us for that. That will be at 630 in the, uh, the parish hall. Again, thank you for coming out. God bless. We close in prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here together to be enlightened, to uh, hear your truth and your, your wisdom, that we might indeed go forth and see, judge, and act according to your will. Amen.